Um, so yeah, my name is Jonas Agree. Uh, I release games under the name Galactical Online. And a little over a year ago, I started development on Forgetting, a procedurally generated puzzle game where the mechanics, the puzzles, and the world are different with each playthrough. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about the benefits and some of the drawbacks of live procedural ge generation in puzzle games. Um, and also guide you through how you can implement procedurally generated puzzles from a design and a technical perspective. But first, um, I see a lot of people in chat talking about The Witness, so I hope a lot of you, most of you have played it. Um, but there will be some small spoilers for The Witness um, in this talk, particularly an optional late game section. So if you don't want that spoiled for you, um, I would click off this and come back later. They will be uploading it to YouTube. Sorry about that, but it is necessary. Um, and with that, I'm going to continue on to that spoiler, which is the challenge from The Witness. Um, just as a reminder, or for those who haven't played it, the challenge is a optional section at the end of The Witness. Um, throughout the game, you're playing dozens of hours of handcrafted puzzles um, until you enter this cave and you're able to start a record player, which plays a piece of classical music and allows you to start going through a series of puzzle panels. Now, after you mess up on one of these panels by entering an incorrect solution or failing to complete the entire gauntlet before the music finishes, you'll notice something interesting. The puzzles have changed completely. They aren't what they were before. And it's not because they're being chosen from any sort of predetermined list, but they're being generated on the fly, on the user's computer, live. This blew my mind when I first played through. Um, this section is incredibly memorable and fun. Um, and The Witness is a game that's famous for hiding revelatory and interesting information from the player over dozens of hours of gameplay only to be um, revealed in an incredible revelation. Um, and this is an example of that in that game that I don't see appreciated nearly enough for just how incredible and fun it was. And so my next question is, why don't more puzzle games do this? There are a lot of puzzles that rely on procedural generation. I'm sure we've seen a lot of them online. Like, uh, for example, the classic Minesweeper. Bombs are randomly placed around the board, and you have to use the numbers to deduce their locations. Also, you can find online some Sudoku generators, which will randomly generate Sudokus uh, in whatever difficulty you like them to come as. But the general perception of these is that they are completely inferior to handcrafted puzzles. We can see that very clearly in the Sudoku community, um, right? There are a lot of people who spend a lot of time handcrafting really good and well-made logic puzzles. Um, and they're all built all around this sort of experience. They're very curated, um, they're intentional, and just generally seen as more successful than these Sudokus, which are generated that feel cheap, noisy, uh, maybe sort of directionless. Maybe they don't have the same sort of intention behind them um, and just overall inferior. But I think the problem with these puzzles that have come to sort of cast a negative light on the idea of a procedurally generated puzzle um, is a few things. It's that they're often presented in complete isolation, um, right? They don't exist to supplement handcrafted puzzles or in a sequence where they have sort of more context um, that makes the player respond better to them. And also these pretty often lack techniques that can help uh, mitigate some of that noise uh, and some of that uh, intentionlessness uh, that can appear in generated puzzles. So the point that I like to make here is that um, handcrafted puzzles aren't necessarily better than procedurally generated and vice versa. These are just two different approaches that each have their own unique benefits and drawbacks and that are best utilized together. But I think that due to some of those examples that I showed before, people under-recognize some of those benefits of procedurally generated puzzles. So I'd like to break down what those are. The first is that um, it enables a unique sort of fail state for your puzzle. Um, often, as designers, we're in a situation where we want to prevent the player from being able to brute force a solution to a puzzle. Uh, this is an example up in the top right from The Witness in an earlier handcrafted portion of the game in which there's a puzzle here which has 15 different exits and the player has to deduce which one is correct by using clues from elsewhere in the world. Um, technically, though, there's nothing stopping the player from just trying each solution until they accidentally stumble upon the right one. What does the game do to mitigate this? Uh, it just makes the screen turn black. It delays the player and forces them to go to a previous area, enter a solution again, and then return. Um, this is effective at communicating to the player 
hey, this is not what you're supposed to be doing, but technically it hasn't stopped a player from brute forcing. It's just slowed them down. The only way to truly stop a player from being able to brute force a puzzle is to stop them from submitting more than one solution and getting feedback from them. And that involves destroying that puzzle that they've just tried to solve. If your puzzles are handcrafted, then obviously the player is going to eventually run out of puzzles. And even if they do, what's stopping them from restarting the game over and trying those puzzles again? It's a long shot, but technically all of these solutions involve it still being possible to cheese these puzzles. If you want a true fail state, one in which we can repeatedly destroy the puzzles that the player has tried to cheese, procedural generation is the only way. It's the only way to have a true, permanent, consequential fail state in your puzzle. And what can this do for you design-wise? A lot of really interesting things that are underutilized in puzzle games. So for example, this property is what gives Minesweeper its flavor. Um, Minesweeper really makes you feel like you're a person sweeping through a minefield trying to avoid bombs. You feel in danger because you know that one wrong click could end it all. The game just wouldn't work if it had an undo or a restart button. Just click somewhere on the screen, undo, try again, click somewhere else, undo. And so because it lacks that, it creates this feeling of high stakes puzzle solving. Like you're diffusing a bomb that has genuine consequences. Um, and this feeling of high stakes puzzle solving is really fun and interesting and underexplored in puzzle game design. And I think it is uniquely enabled by procedural generation. Um, the second benefit is a raised skill ceiling. Um, I've heard it said that in games, simply adding a timer uh, will give players a reason to keep replaying your game. Um, the idea of speedrunning motivates players to master a game's mechanics at a level that's deeper than anything they would encounter in the main game. I'm sure you've seen speedruns where new techniques that the creators never thought of are discovered uh, even years later after the game's release. Uh, the principle that behind this is that when you allow players to create their own goalposts, they will necessarily exceed the ones that you've set out for them. This works really well for a lot of uh, action games. Like, for example, here's Hollow Knight, a really long video series that uh, explains all of the complicated and advanced techniques you would never know about from just completing the main game. Now, can we allow players to engage in this same process of mechanic mastery and setting their own goalposts when engaging with the actual puzzle mechanics? I'd say that we can, but only through procedural generation. The primary skill that's being tested when players speed run procedurally generated puzzle sequences, such as the challenge from the witness, is their actual puzzle solving ability. Um, here's a 13 part video series from the uh, uh, speedrunner and puzzle game developer Rabbit Jellyfish uh, walking players through how to speedrun the challenge. Uh, the techniques that are in these videos are things that even after I had 100% completed the game, I hadn't ever acknowledged or thought about before. Um, and that shows just how deeply players are motivated to engage with mechanics when that ceiling is removed, when there's always a new puzzle that they can use to repeatedly train and master those abilities. Hypothetically, it could be possible to get players to that same level of mastery by using handcrafted puzzles. I won't deny that, but if the witness couldn't do it over dozens of hours and over 600 handcrafted puzzles, I'd say it's a pretty tall order and procedurally generating puzzles is going to be your best bet for allowing players to engage with your mechanics at this sort of a deep level. So after hearing some of those unique benefits, I hope you're at least interested in what it might look like to incorporate some elements of procedural generation into your puzzle game. But how do you get started doing that? There are a lot of really advanced techniques that you can use to improve results and uh, optimize things, but I just wanna talk about the most general and simple approaches that you can use to quickly get started because getting procedural puzzle generation up and running and getting it working well is not that complicated. Uh, it just requires a few simple ideas. So the first thing is that when you have a blank sheet and you're wanting to generate a new puzzle, there are two approaches that I'd say you can use, puzzle up and solution down. Um, for puzzle up, it, you, it involves placing the elements in the puzzle, then using a solver to walk through and find all possible solutions to it. So in this example where we're generating a maze, uh, we would randomly place walls, those are the elements, and then use a maze solving algorithm to find all the different possible solutions and determine that the puzzle is solvable. Uh, this technique is great because it is thorough and it shows you multiple different possible solutions and it can allow you to refine your results 
and even determine difficulty of your puzzle based on uh, how many solutions exist. The issue with it is that because it's so thorough, it can be slow and wasteful, especially for more complicated puzzle types than this sort of silly example of a maze solving algorithm, um, right? For more complicated puzzles, it takes a lot of work to traverse the entire possibility space as a solver. Um, that can just be too much uh, for your system to need to do. And especially if you're wanting to generate puzzles on the fly like the witness does, that's where you need to take some shortcuts. So solution down is the other approach. First, you designate a random path or intended solution then place elements around the puzzle world that justify or force that solution. Um, this approach is much more performant because it doesn't involve needing to have an extensive or complicated solver for your puzzle type. Just a sort of bot or dumb approach that can move around and show one possible set of actions the player could take. Then you're able to just place the elements that will allow that to be a correct solution. The problem is that it is less thorough right? Your result might end up having multiple solutions. And because you haven't run the solver, you don't have a way of knowing that. So the question is, which approach should you use? Often, these are best used in conjunction, right? If you're trying to efficiently generate a puzzle, you want to work puzzle up and then solution down and meet somewhere in the middle to get the most efficient results. So here's an example of that. Uh, if we are making a, wanting to procedurally generate soccer band puzzles, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with them. The way that soccer band puzzles work is the player pushes crates onto targets in order to beat levels. Let's say we wanted to work purely puzzle up on uh, generating the soccer band puzzle. Let's randomly place some walls, some crates, and some targets here on the left, then run a solver to see if the puzzle is possible. The problem here is that these puzzles are often impossible for reasons that aren't immediately apparent. Uh, looking at this puzzle on the left that was randomly generated, uh, it might seem reasonable that there could be a solution. You'd want to start making a few moves to see, but after you make those moves, you'd quickly realize that there is no possible solution here. Um, the other issue is that with a puzzle type like Sokoman, determining what exact steps can be taken next and what places you've already been is an expensive process, much more so than our maze example. Right? It needs to index all of these crates, make sure they're being pushed, uh, which places they can be pushed to. Uh, it needs to track the position of everything and make sure it hasn't been in that state before. Uh, and the result is just a solver that frequently generates impossible puzzles and spends a lot of effort determining that they were impossible in the first place. So let's incorporate some solution down for a shortcut. We'll start puzzle up by randomly placing the walls in the crates, but wait to place the targets. Then we're going to have a bot that just randomly pushes the crates around unintelligently. It doesn't need to search every single solution, just one. Then we place the targets on the location where those crates ended up in the middle, then reset the player and the crates to their initial position. Now we have a puzzle that we know has at least one solution. It might have multiple, but that's all right, because we've saved an incredible amount of time by not having to run that expensive solver. And this is the sort of puzzle that you could quickly and easily generate on the fly by combining puzzle up and solution down generation. Uh, for the second example, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I solve these problems in my own game, Forgetting. So in the game, you explore an open world of uh, connected rooms uh, containing puzzle panels. And your goal is to learn the rules of each symbol contained on those panels. So in this example on the right, on this panel, uh, there's two pluses. The plus symbol means that it wants to be part of a green shape, so uh, one where both buttons have been put pushed down and have an area equal to the number of pluses. So there's two pluses. Both of these tiles have been pushed down, and the puzzle is solved. And this isn't a spoiler. The rules are randomly generated with each playthrough, so you might not even see this variant when you actually play the game. I don't know. Now, these mechanics were designed to be intentionally easy for a solver to thoroughly search through each time. Uh, there's no complicated state that needs to be tracked like Sakaban. It just simply counts up in binary by pushing down the different buttons on the puzzle board. So for this small puzzle size, uh, the way that we count through every single solution is by starting at the left uh, with 0, 0, neither push down, 0, 1, with one push down, 1, 0, with the other one pushed down, and then 1-1 one, one with both of them pushed down. So now we've searched every possible solution the player could enter, and we know which ones work. So here's what it looks like to do that generation on a complicated puzzle. First, we randomly place some symbols on the board. Then we count through all possible solutions up in binary. 
And you can see on this board, it's four by four, so it's 16 tiles, each with two possible options. So two to the 16 is 65,000 something. It's a lot of things to check, but it's such a simple space to traverse. Counting up in binary, it's a simple thing for a computer to do. It can genuinely do this check in under a frame because of how optimized it is. Um, and that's part of how the game works is that it was designed to be easy to generate in this way. So then we just save a list of all of those uh, solutions out of the 65,000 that actually solved the puzzle. And so those are the approaches that we use to get started making puzzles that uh, are made efficiently, that are guaranteed to be valid, but that are probably not very good, right? A lot of these puzzles are going to be noisy. They're going to have inconsistent difficulty. They're often going to be too easy, and they're going to completely lack any sort of feeling of direction or intention behind them. This is a problem that a lot of those isolated puzzles uh, we saw before, like those generated Sudokus, um, suffer from. And so what are some of the ways that we can mitigate these issues? Well, there are a lot of different techniques, especially that are going to be specific to your puzzle type. But these are just some of the most general techniques that I'd say would work in most situations. Um, the first is incremental change. What we do is add one element at a time and then use the solver after each step to see how many solutions there are. The result is that by here in this left image, you can see we add one wall at a time until we've generated a maze, which there has only one solution. That result has a minimum number of elements. So it seems like there are a lot of uh, different places the player could go to, but there's only one correct uh, solution because we incrementally added that. We could even do the opposite, where we fill the entire screen with elements and remove one at a time to create a much more forced and easy solution, or uh, maybe at the beginning of a puzzle gauntlet section or something like that. Um, the important thing about incremental change is that it needs to work a lot like your solver, right? Your solver is probably able to um, backtrack its steps, especially like a Sakuban solver. It can try making certain moves, then it can rewind and try a different move until it's explored all the possibilities. Um, incrementally, your generator needs to work the same way. You can see in this top left image, there are too many solutions. It's ambiguous. The player could go up or they could go down. We want there to just be one solution. So we randomly add a wall, but we can see that this has had an unintended effect of making it so that now there are no solutions. So what we need to be able to do is go back one, undo the last block that was placed so that the puzzle is possible again, and place a different element somewhere else. Um, and you're going to want to keep sort of repeating this process in order to um, get the exact number of elements that you need. But I'm sure you're thinking, especially for larger and more complicated puzzles, that's pretty wasteful just going one at a time. If you were to imagine with the maze example, an eight by eight maze, it's probably not even going to start getting difficult until you have a certain number of walls there. Um, and let's say that we're generating puzzles of a lot of different sizes. You don't want to memorize what the exact starting number of walls should be for each different size. What we can use is something similar to binary search to find the perfect number of elements quickly and efficiently for any size of puzzle. So this is an eight by eight maze. And we start out by filling 50% of the possible 64 tiles with walls. So now there's 32 walls. Then we see that there's no solutions. So we're going to subtract 50% of those 32 walls, resulting in 16 walls. Now there are too many solutions. So we're going to add 50% of those 16 walls back. That results in 24 walls, too many solutions, add 50% of 24, results in 36, not enough solutions, and so on. Um, this will continue and quickly get to the perfect number that it needs in order to have a small number of solutions. Whereas before, we would have had to do 18 steps to search to here. You can see here we've done five in order to get to 18 blocks being a good number. Um, the problem is that this isn't exactly a binary search. It has a random nature to it. So you might end up in a situation where you're adding and removing 50% of blocks, and it's just not possible for you to quickly get only one solution. So you have to know where to back out or to accept a less than perfect result. When you're doing live procedural generation, that's just something that I think you have to accept and design around a little bit. The second technique is batching and mechanic checking. So we have a problem where we want to demonstrate a particular facet of our game's mechanics. Um, for example, let's say we're going back to Sakuban, and we have a variant of Sakuban where we have multi-push. Normally in Sakuban, you can't push two crates at a time, like seen on the left. But in our example, let's say that you can. And we want to demonstrate that to the player. Um, a naive approach would be to have our generator create puzzles that look something like the situation on the left. 
place two crates next to each other, make it so there's only one direction they can be pushed from, and the player will definitely see that this is a mechanic. But what we actually want are puzzles that more subtly use this mechanic in interesting ways. Like a simple example here on the right is sort of what we want. It's a puzzle where it's not immediately obvious upon looking at it that multi-push will be required, but once you start making moves and the computer starts running the solver, it will see that any solution to this puzzle involves using multi-push. So our problem is that we don't know from initially looking at a puzzle whether or not it's going to use a mechanic. What we need to do is batch our creation of those puzzles together in a sequence. Um, imagine that we're creating something sort of like the challenge from The Witness, where we start easy and then introduce more mechanics as we progress. We're going to generate all of those together in one batch. So we'll start by making one random puzzle and then run the solver on it. While we're running that solver, we'll wait and see if there's any point where the player pushes two crates. In this left puzzle, we can see there's no possible point where the player could ever push uh, two different crates at the same time. So we're going to categorize that as no multi-push and sort it towards the beginning of our puzzle gauntlet. Then we're going to keep generating puzzles, and eventually we'll create the one that's on the right. Um, it's clear that at this point in this puzzle, multi-push is the only way to solve it. So we're going to categorize it later in the section where we do take advantage of multi-push. Let's imagine now that we have the opposite sort of a problem. Often puzzles are interesting not because they allow the player to demonstrate that they do have some special ability, but because they force the player to acknowledge some sort of restriction. So imagine the exact opposite, that we have soccer band now without multi-push, and we want to create a puzzle that is interesting because the player is not able to push two blocks at the same time. Like this example here, it would be trivially easy if the game did have multi-push. One move to the right would solve the puzzle, but because multi-push is not here, the puzzle becomes a little bit more interesting. The player has to do some shuffling and some moving around to solve it. So we want players to acknowledge that restriction in these puzzles. The way that we do that is by, again, batching them together and running solvers on each randomly generated puzzle. But instead of just running one solver on each puzzle, we're going to run two. The first solver is the one that has the standard rules in the game, which are, in this case, the restrictive ones that do not have multi-push. Then we're going to run a second solver, you can see at the bottom, which does have multi-push. Then we're going to look at the lengths of those solutions or the differences between them. So the first solution without multi-push required 17 moves to beat it. The one with multi-push requires one move. There's a large difference between those two solvers. So we can say that this is a puzzle that demonstrates that restriction effectively to the player. So that was a lot of information given really quick about some of the general approaches that you can use for procedural puzzle generation. So let me go through all of it really quick one more time. So why should we use procedurally generated puzzles? They have their own drawbacks, but they have unique and underutilized benefits. They are the only way to give your game a true fail state and enable this sort of feeling of high stakes, high pressure puzzle solving. And also they're able to raise the ceiling uh, on which your players are able to exhibit mastery of your mechanics beyond the levels that you are able to curate for them and repeatedly allow them to demonstrate their skill and mastery over the puzzle solving in your game. Um, how do we incorporate procedurally generated puzzles? At the most basic level, we can use puzzle up generation, which involves placing the elements of the puzzle, then using a solver to find all solutions, or we can use solution down generation, in which we designate a particular solution, then place elements to justify and force that solution. These approaches are often best used together in order to quickly and efficiently create valid puzzles. And then how can we improve those results of the puzzle? We can incrementally generate our puzzles by placing one block at a time, removing one block at a time, or doing a binary search over the number of elements that we place at a time in order to find the perfect number of elements to force one solution while, not giving, while still giving the player different options and not making it too obvious what the intended solution is. And also we can batch our puzzle generation together and then categorize those resulting puzzles based on the facets of your mechanic which they use. Finally, I want to include a call to action. Add the challenge to your puzzle game. So my game Forgetting incorporates procedural generation at every level, but your game doesn't have to. The challenge from The Witness, it's a perfect blueprint for how you can use procedural generation to supplement your handcrafted puzzles and keep players playing for longer. I hope that I've demonstrated that getting started with procedurally generating your puzzles isn't too complicated. You can do it. And the final reason I'm asking this is a selfish one. 
I really want to play more puzzle games with the challenge in them. So please make those games so that I can play them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonah. That was wonderful. Amazing talk. Makes me want to play Forgetting right now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. we, cool. we had a few questions in the chat. Awesome. Um, and I had a question of my own as well. Uh, so I'll get to the ones in the chat first. Um, from Plush Lola in the chat. Um, do you think there are ways to translate everything interesting about puzzles into algorithms? Things like tricking the player that might not show up in the state space. Hmm. I lean towards, I don't know if I can rule on definitively is everything <laughs> possible. That's a very complicated computer science -y sort of question. You can see I'm taking a really simple approach to how I do things and how I communicate them. But I would say, yeah, there are specifically with tricking the player, that's sort of a thing that I demonstrated how to do with the restrictive demonstration. Um, that one puzzle, I can skip back to it, showed one that would be very easy if you have multi-push. I'm not able to find it. It would be very, <laughs> <laughs> it would be very easy if you have multi-push. So the player is probably going to try and press to the right one time. Uh, you can see, yeah, here in the bottom right, they're probably going to try and press to the uh, to the right um, when, in fact, the correct solution is something else. So that is something that has been done here procedurally by having two different solvers and highlighting the difference, like the delta between those two complicated, uh, the complication levels of those two solutions. We've, I've intentionally tricked the player to make them be forced to acknowledge a restriction. So yeah, that's a technique that you, you can translate. And there are a lot of cool techniques that uh, I'm sure that I haven't even thought about that you can use to, to do things like that. Absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I love to think about how all, cause like when we approach designing puzzles, there's so many aspects we think about it. It's really fascinating to think about how they might all potentially be procedurally generatable. Um, anyway, uh, next question, uh, was from Batman Jones or Batman Jones. Um, Asking Jonah, do you think there is a way to use ProcGen to define slash generate puzzle mechanics themselves to any degree, or do you feel we're limited to selecting randomly from a pool of mechanics? Uh, I guess in your game, are you selecting from a pool of mechanics or are you generating it's, mechanics? That's a really good question. It's something I'm still experimenting with, but right mm. now it's sort of a it's sort of selecting from a pool, but it blends them a little bit. It's a pool that combines different wrinkles in them. Um, so the main thing is, yeah, I'm sure you could generate different, um, the mechanics randomly, um, like fully randomly and have a computer establish some sort of pattern between them. But um, part of my goal with the game is that I want those mechanics that are generated to be able to be easily described by a human in one sentence, hmm. right? I don't want it to be something like, uh, yeah, the computer noticed there's something here. It's like the Fibonacci uh, sequence when you enter that. Like, I want it to be something that people can realistically understand. And so within that restriction, yeah, it selects from a pool, but it combines elements from different pools. For example, like the one that I showed where the plus uh, means it wants to be part of an area of that size of buttons that are pushed in to be green. Um, there's also another RNG role that happens when generating that mechanic that says, well, could that area be either color or does it have to be one particular color? Um, and is this area able to um, share its area with other symbols? Do those areas add or do they subtract or something funky like that? There are a lot of little things that change when selecting from that pool that adds a lot more depth and increases the amount of options that can happen. But it is a really interesting question. Can you generate those mechanics fully procedurally in a way that humans could understand them? That's That's an interesting problem. Fascinating answer. Uh, so then my question I had, because I don't think another one came up, if I didn't miss anybody's question. Uh, my question, because you mentioned being able to generate some of the puzzles like within a frame, right? Mm, yeah. Um, I was wondering in forgetting, do you actually need to generate them per frame? Are you able to like generate them in advance? Like the, the challenge, for example, in the witness, I presume it can generate them like when you start the challenge. Although I guess there are times when you fail and you have to come back forwards again, but like, it's not necessarily having to do it uh, exactly within the frame, like as soon as you see the puzzle, for example. What yeah, it's super it's interesting how it works. There's, I think I saw it in a video. So it was Giant Bombs playing the witness with Jonathan Blow, where Jonathan Blow breaks down a little bit how that procedural generation works. Hmm. Um, and what he says is that 
the way that it works in the witness is that the puzzles are generated one at a time so you'll see that in the whole sequence there's like black panel black panel and they'll turn on one at a time when a panel turns on it just was generated so it's generating them one at a time in a single frame and um but jonathan blow was complaining he was lamenting that on the ps4 unfortunately sometimes the player will lose a frame um but it is remarkably fast how they generate them but in forgetting i also um do certain approaches when you mess up in this game and it resets a panel um i'm also able to generate them not in a single frame but over multiple frames while the player is playing just to be safe mm -hmm. because um you know I'm, I'm i'm hoping to deploy for like mobile and stuff so the game has systems to where it's able to generate over multiple frames and then store a future puzzle so that when you mess up and it needs to generate a new one it has one stored that it generated over multiple frames so yeah, sometimes you have to do that, but... Um, right, makes sense to generate in advance when you can. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I think that is all the time we've got. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, see you all.